All right, welcome to Unwriting and Stuff. Uh, this will be going to, this is, uh, I'm Scott Moon, from scottmoonwriter.com, and this is Josh Hayes. Josh Hayes, what's your website? Uh, joshhayeswriter.com. Okay, awesome. Uh, this is going to be the first of our podcasts in this series. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit about what to name it and some topics on writing, maybe some project notes and things like that. Cool. So, Let's and of course, I, I'd been sitting here for an hour hoping the kids wouldn't come walking in the door while we started. And here comes one right now. Nice. Hey, buddy. He wants to be on air. No, go ahead and shut the door. All right, go play. I'm recording live. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that worked great. So a minute ago, they were up banging around upstairs and it kind of sounded fun. All the, you know, you could hear them playing and laughing. It's like a playground. But I figured once I started recording that there would be like, Screaming and gnashing of teeth, yeah, and doing and what? Yeah. yeah, nice. I've got my uh, my wonderful mother to uh, sit with the baby while I waste valuable writing time. Awesome. That's the way it goes. So, uh, all right. So, I think uh, we have our face. Let's start first with like what we're going to do for our title. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The right stuff, I like it. We've used that for our Facebook page. Um, that's and that's a closed group. So is that something we want to open up? Yeah, or? I think we can open it up. I, I was going to invite uh, the thing is with Facebook groups. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, that that big huge space opera group that we're a part of has like sixty five hundred members, and sometimes mm -hmm. I think uh, it's just way too much the writers group i like but even that is i think still way too much i think if we open it up and have like you know 50 members or something that are actually serious about learning how to do the craft and right working on it instead of you know hey here read this this is what i wrote and see you know what i mean yeah exactly i people that can be can bring things to the table other than just us handing out a whole bunch of stuff to people. Not that we have a lot to hand out. Yeah. But yeah, well, a, a lot of the pages I've been on, it, it gets to be, it's kind of a buy my book. They post on it and they don't participate in the, right. in the page. The, um, <clears throat> I got, I'm on the smarter, smarter artist page because mm -hmm. I won that, that trip. And people don't promote their books. I mean, if they do, it's very, very minimal on that. You know, it's more talking about this is what I'm trying to do with writing. This is the questions I have, you know, and I think it'd be good to network and do some promotion. But, yeah, like 6,500 members with that just post their latest release every, you know, couple of months would be kind of useless. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's fun to hang out and have the uh, what are you, the inside jokes of all the stuff that you know, like I watch the movies and books and stuff. But just to have like a specific craft page, uh, and the thing is with the space upper uh, writers page, there's a lot of really good help there. But yeah. like me and you, a lot of the stuff that we write isn't necessarily space opera. So just having some kind of place where people can come in and present their present their work yeah. isn't genre specific. I think that would be kind of cool. Talking about space opera last week, I had, I had Googled and kind of on the, trying to get a, a locked down definition on space opera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I wound up finding my way to a free John Carter book. Oh, uh, John um, Carter of Mars. Right. And, um, you know, it was, um, you know, I started reading it. It was actually pretty good. <laughs> I was kind of surprised. You know, it's well, I've never great. actually read the book. I've seen the movie. Yeah. And the movie, it's kind of cheesy. But yeah, it, it, compared to like uh, Jupiter Ascending or some other really super cheap uh, or like the sci-fi movies, like sci-fi.com movies, like uh, the alligator versus the giant shark. Or a right, Chicago or whatever. It was actually pretty good. It wasn't too bad, uh, but I have not read those. I need to. 
<laughs> well, yeah, and the other thing I was learning is that they actually there was actually two types of science fiction originally. There was space opera, and then there was like planetary, planetary, which is what uh, John Carter Mars was, kind of more of a survivalist story, if anything. Mm-hmm. So, and I haven't seen the movie yet. I, I went and looked for it that day, and I didn't find it. And then I saw something shiny, got distracted. So, oh, what's that? <clears throat> what's that? Let's read something else. So, yeah, and I, I love this the. Uh, the space opera Facebook page, you know, a lot of neat people on there, but I just don't usually have enough time to participate like I should. You know, it's funny. Uh, while we're talking about mentioning space opera is that, um, you've read the, um, the expanse books, right? Leviathan wakes. Oh yeah. I loved them. There's a few parts that were, that were a little bit rough here and there, but I, yeah. I liked all of them. You know, um, they they uh, sold that as space opera, but as I understand space opera, I don't I don't think that that the series is space opera. I mean, when you get to book four, there's a lot more characters and even three, but um, the TV show that they labeled as space opera is not space opera. It's space. No, opera. I I think it's yeah yeah. I don't know what how I would classify it, but I wouldn't call it space opera. Well, because like the way I classify space opera is um, Peter Hamilton books, uh, Pandora, Star, and Judas Unchained, which are enormous books, but they have, in my opinion, like space opera is tons of characters, lots of characters swashbuckling in space. Yeah, maybe not so heavy on the actual science, right? Um, kind yeah. of a serial type thing generally. Yeah, exactly. And with his books, they're uh, they're very uh, character centric. Um, like, oh, man, he has in uh, in the first book, he introduces like probably seven characters, and it's really hard to uh, when you read it the first time. It's really hard to kind of keep track of who's doing what and where they're at and why. But then by the end of the book, it all makes sense and it all comes back together, um, which is why I think Leviathan Wakes getting sold as space opera is kind of underselling the genre, maybe, because there's so much. Oh, yeah, it's horror. it's it's pretty intense. The characterization, especially in the first book, and um, I really like what was what was a detective character? Uh, Miller. I like Miller, and what was and, I, and I'm so bad with remembering the specifics. What was the, the captain's name? Captain Holden. Uh, Holden. Holden, right? Miller and Holden. I almost wish they had been in two separate books. They didn't make good. Yeah. Um, they didn't make good co-stars. They were both too. They both had too much force, I guess, in the narrative going. And yeah. when they when they were apart, it was okay. When they met up, it's like that's that was the worst part of the whole series for me. When they were together. It was really unnatural, and it kind of they kind of both morphed. Especially Miller. Miller became all of a sudden this killer. Yeah, where I hadn't really got that before. Well, and, um, and, they, and he kept and switching the viewpoints back. Even when they were together, he would switch the viewpoints back and forth yeah. for no real reason other than he'd been doing it the whole book. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it's like I got to give them both equal time because they're you know in the book and they'd switch back and forth, but. Yeah, well, when he as soon as the first time I read it, as soon as I read the the phrase "vomit zombie," I almost stopped reading it because I was like, "Like, this yeah, book has been done published by a, a major publisher, and vomit zombie takes up how many chapters in? It was a from, lot from the half." To like the three quarter mark, it was all, and the vomit zombies were running down. I'm like, yeah, and yeah. it's like vomit zombies could be its own genre. Yeah, yeah space opera, vomit uh, zombies. Yeah, the uh, it's kind of like Stephen King. Every now and then, he gets deep into the bodily functions in some of his characters. It's like he regresses back to like junior right. high school. Um, <clears throat> well, before we started this, we talked about a couple of possible topics. You know. And I remember we talked about uh, some viewpoints. So what, what we're talking about right there was uh, was a good kind of lead in into viewpoint and how it affects the narrative flow. So thoughts? Yeah. Um, 
you, you were talking about head jumping and limited uh, limited third person, basically. Um, yeah, limited I omniscient. I tell you who I think who does it well, but uh, sometimes who I can't stand reading, but I love his books is uh, Martin in the Game of Thrones. Oh yeah, where every every chapter is v extremely limited third person, and uh but there's you know in the first book there's what three or four point of view characters the thing that i like about the main him, ones yeah yeah the thing that i like about that he does is his is not only is it a limited third person it's a limited third person with a little bit of unreliable narrative because you're learning about the world through uh that particular point of view character's perspective right um, but it's warped into right because they don't know everything right and it's so much history and so right. much going on so, so yeah um you know and so people like oh in the first book you have you have was Arya a point of view character in the first book uh yeah i'm pretty sure she was because remember she's chasing the cats around she gets yeah. needle yeah um she was in the water dancing and yeah so you have like a limited you have a little girl's point right it's still water a very it's a very naive kind of, well, it starts out naive uh, yeah. point of view <laughs> book. And then by the end of the book, she's experienced all this stuff that's happened and it's opened her eyes. And you've, you have um, Ned's point of view, which is, um, you know, very experienced, very kind of level headed. But he's naive in his own way too. Right. And that's what gets him. Killed. Yeah. Cause he thinks that the truth is, or the uh, being honest and being truthful is going to be able to, yeah, it's going to do the right thing will work out in the end, which in, in, in Martin's universe, that's not so. No, it's not. You know what? I actually heard something. I found a podcast with uh, Brandon Sanderson and a couple other people this morning. They were talking about Martin's uh, world building and, and the way he built his world. Mm -hmm. and I didn't ever realize this, and I don't know if you've read, you've read the books twice, um, but his world has no moon. I never thought about it. You know, I've never, you know, come thinking back, I've never heard them talk about the moon. Yeah, there's no there's no moon in the series. And the reason they were talking about that is um, um, Sanderson's uh, Storm, Storm Like Ar Archive, um, they were talking about his world has no uh, tilt. There's no right. axis tilt. And that's why the seasons go so fast. Well, in Martin's world, there's no moon. So that could explain... It doesn't really, but it could explain something of the weather, how it why why winter can be right. you know, years and years long. That's interesting. I have in in my work my work in progress. They there there's some scenes on a moon of crash down, and it's gravity locked. And I recently had read something about how most moons are gravity locked. So basically, they always face oh the planet there, right. and that makes sense to me. I'm not quite sure how that's going to affect much about that part of the story, but. <clears throat> So. so I think um, when you're talking about point of views, uh, just to hop back on su a subject real quick. If right. you, you haven't read uh, Dune, Dune, I love Dune, they head hop in that book like crazy, and they don't yeah. even do it. And, and Herbert, man, everybody was like, everybody always says, don't head hop. Like write a whole scene from one point. Right, of view. your editor is screaming at you. Yeah. Samantha, Samantha, when she edited Enemy of Man the first time, she was like, what are you doing? You can't head hop. And to me, I wasn't really head hopping so much as because there's a difference between being in somebody's head and like, like if I'm the main character, I can see what somebody does. And right. some of their some of what they're thinking is betrayed by their behavior. And you know what they're you know? thinking. Just right. Like if I'm the main character and I watch somebody bunch their face up and do their fist, I can say, you know, he moved forward. And he was angry yeah. because I can see that he's angry unless he laughs in a really strange, angry manner or something like that. But, alien, but to me, so to me, that wasn't head hopping, but, but yeah. But yeah, so she, do, and they do it like every paragraph almost like they'll go between yeah. the Jesuit mother and then go back to Paul and then go to whoever. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm currently, I'm listening to uh Wolf of the Plain mm -hmm. uh, by Con. Con Golden, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, and it's part of the Conqueror series. I got it, and um, I like obviously historical fiction stuff. <clears throat> but he had, and it's a great story. I really love it. I love the reader, Stefan Rudnicki. Um, 
but it's a, it's a, I'm really getting into the story now. I'm really loving. I'll probably listen to all five books, but he had, like uh, hops. Or what? it's, uh, it's basically the rise of Genghis Khan. So it's oh, like, so is it, re- it's, is it factual or is it fiction? Well, it's historical fiction. I did a little bit of just wiki research and okay. there's some things he changes. Like in this story, he has a, uh, I can't even pronounce his name. Uh, Tamajin or something like that is the main character, which would be Genghis Khan eventually, if I remember my history right. But he uh, he has an older brother in the fiction story, and he winds up killing him at some point, which makes his mom mad because he killed because the protagonist killed his his brother. Mm. But in, at least in the history stuff, I double checked or did my fact checking while I was bored one day. That was actually a stepbrother, or something like that. So, so I'm not really sure. You know, there's some things that are different, but it's uh, it's not fantasy. There's no fantasy elements um, like a lot of historical fiction. It's kind of in the ballpark, mm-hmm. but not necessarily. You would want to write your thesis paper for your history class based on it. It feels his books and um, um, Bernard Cornwell. He has a Saxon series and. A lot of those, they've read a lot like um, Game of Thrones, except without the magic. Um, oh. And I got, I got onto this Connie Goulden guy because he wrote a nonfiction or a historical fiction book called War of the Roses, which is basically a lot like Game of Thrones. So. I'm pretty sure that's what they say that he, that he uh, well, not that book, but that period in time. Is oh, yeah. Well, if, you look, if you look at Westeros, it looks kind of like England if it got smashed. Oh, yeah. If you look at it, you know, it's kind of a long, narrow island, and there's a big continent off to the side. Uh, so what's, what's your favorite viewpoint to write from? I mean, I kind of know because I've read most – well, not most of your stuff. I've read a lot of stuff. You know, uh, I've most of my stuff that I've written is third person, um, but I've got an idea for a first person um, story about an assassin, but he's like snarky at the same time. So he kind of has like personality while he's killing people, um, which I don't know if, if it's just like my legal way to go out and cause mayhem and ruckus. Yeah, that's what writing and reading in general is for. Yeah. So I don't know. I really like, I really like um, third person is in my opinion, the easiest way to do, if you want to convey not art, but like first person, it's you, you, you never, you never see the other side. You never see anything else. It's very by its nature limited. You can't get in somebody else's head or. So unless you have a really intriguing character, first person kind of sucks. Well, and I, some people say first person is the easiest to write, but to me it's the hardest because it's easy to write like the first 10 pages. You write in first person, it's like you're just talking, everything's great, and, and then the plot has to move forward. Yeah. And you can only use what the character, your first person character is talking about. Right. And you can come through some weird contrivances to try and get enough conflict or or information into that first person point of view. So I, I actually don't like first person for that that reason at all. I like third person because you can, if you want to go to different, uh, you can add a little bit more or you can, you know, like we're talking about the head jumping. Um, Martin, George R. R. Martin, he changes his point of view with every chapter, Mm -hmm. which I think that's perfect. And that's kind of the way I'm doing it right now. That's why I've been doing it for a while. If you want to have more than one character, you need some kind of clean break. I think it adds to the tension too. Yeah, I agree. And, um, I can think when you were talking about having it uh, pushing the f- plot forward on first person um, in the the book that I'm planning after I get second star finished for Ed, uh, Edge of Valor where they have it's going to be a mix between third person and first person mm-hmm. and the third person narrative is going to be the basically the main character of the book and then the first person you know it's going to be when he's interviewing these people he, they're going to tell him uh, their story. So it's, it's going to be like extremely limited first person that's unreliable and biased at the same time. And I wrote, 
I think I've written 30,000 words of narrative so far in that one. But I tell you, it's, it's hard because with first person, with third person, it, the narrative voice is your voice. And then the characters say what they want to say in, in their quotes, in their voice. They have their own voice, but the book is your voice. But when you right. talk about first person, that narrative is the character's voice, not yours. So right. like I'm coming up, it's not necessarily a brick wall because I'm not there yet. But I'm like, if I'm going to have, let's say I have four I think four perspectives that are completely different because they're four different characters um, that I, I want to write, but I don't, I'm scared because when I write them, I don't want them to sound the same because they're different characters. So like, that's why, like sometimes when you read, read like, like uh, Jillian Flynn, I don't know if you've ever read her stuff. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. She like gone girl is first person by two different perspectives um dark places is first i think all of hers are first person um and sh the two dark places and sharp objects I josh thought, i think i'm cool. hearing my voice to your mic are you i don't know if that's giving us some feedback or something uh, i don't know if you have headphones yeah let me see if i can let me see if this helps I wasn't hearing it before. I don't know if we turned it up or what. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, yep. That sounds good. I think that sounds better. Um, <clears throat> the, the first part, I wasn't hearing myself, but just that last the last bit when you're talking about Jillian Flynn, I could I started to hear when I say, uh-huh, I hear, uh-huh, bounce around your room. Oh, so. nice. But anyway, you were, you were saying you're talking, you're talking about Jillian Flynn. And, yeah. Um, the, the first book was is Gone Girl. Yeah, Sharp Objects and Dark Places were her first two books. Gone Girl's just her most recent book. And uh, I can't think of a character difference. Like, if you read them, you could read them as the same character because they sound alike. Like, they have right. different past experiences and their, their history is different. The character is different, but they sound the same. And uh, I think Gone Girl did a, a good job of splitting. Of course, there's a guy and a girl, so the narrative is going to be it's going to be different, but she did a really good job of making the characters. Yeah. I was surprised that, that, that gone girl worked as good as it did because it's really kind of a gimmick. You know? Well, I didn't like the ending at all. I like, I like the narrative. I liked the, the book and then the twists were nice, but the last twist she had at the end of the, <clears> the book, it was just like, eh, there would be no way that I'd do what that guy did. You know what I yeah, mean? That, after that after was, all that, I was wanting to punch him in the face after a while. I, I like the first half of Gone Girl a lot better than the second half. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued, um, but I thought, you know, obviously it did well. Everybody liked it, but I thought the first half was a much better book. It seemed more honest. The second half, it was becoming more plot-driven and less character-driven. Yeah. Um, but having said that, the switch, the big revelation in that book was actually pulled off. That could have fell on its face a lot. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah, and that's the thing with with uh, first person is that you can have you can have um, you can have good twists in your plot and have it come out of nowhere almost because it, it's your perspective or it's the narrator's perspective, so you don't know what's going on anywhere else. So you know, it's not just what's going on around that character; it's going on in the world. So when something happens and it messes with the character and it comes out of left field, then it can literally happen out of the blue. But when you write in third person and you have several different characters, it's it's kind of like the deuce, deuce ex machina. Deuce ex machina, however yeah. you want to pronounce it. Yeah. I pronounce it different than, than most people I know. The deuce, deuce ex machina. There God you go. The machine. Right. Yeah. Well, when it comes out like that in third person, if you've got several different yeah, specifically if you've got like a protagonist and an antagonist point of view during your book mm -hmm. and then something just happens out of nowhere, then you're like, come on, that's, that's a crutch. Yeah. You wrote yourself into a corner and the only thing you can do is, oh, here's a magic ray gun that will kill Sa everyone. Saved by the, the cavalry. Uh, right. Saved by the cavalry. I, I've been trying to write more to where I don't really have protagonist antagonists and I haven't got there yet, but I'd like to just have basically two 
I almost said two protagonists, but really you need two antagonists because basically two characters that are in conflict mm-hmm. and neither one of them is more morally right than the other. Um, that's something I'm working towards um, from a craft point of view. And that, you know, I've almost thought about some of my current works writing basically the book twice, write it once from one point of view, write it once from the other point of view, and then find the middle ground. But I haven't quite got there because I have like 50 projects I'm working on, <laughs> literally. <laughs> I made a thought. I made a thought. Remember um, last summer I was doing the, um, the dragon naturally speaking voice dictation and I was writing a science fiction series and I did, Hey, we got some high fives. Awesome. The, uh, uh, your fat, your fat Fuqua and Darren, 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 Darren Bicknell looks like. How's it going? Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. The, um, but anyway, I'd done that. Hey, buddy, I'm still recording. Okay, give me a minute. <laughs> it's family right. time. But basically, I had started that, and I started using the voice dictation, and I wrote 30,000 words in about four days. I mean, actually, I spoke 30,000 words. Right. And then I, I got, of course, like me, I saw something shiny, and I went ran it off after a new, a new greatest, best idea. But I started looking at that yesterday, and I was going through it, and I was like, I actually really like it. And so I don't know when, but that one's definitely going to be um, a future project. Is that your YA yeah. book you were telling me about yesterday? It's it's kind of why the main characters are basically enlistment age. It's kind of in the future. There's some mandatory enlistment things going on. They go into the city, uh, basically the capital. They're, they kind of live in the borderlands and they're like, um, you know, grew up farm kids, um, real self-sufficient. Well, they go in and their uncle is in the, in the town and they have some conflicts. The uncle winds up getting killed and it, and it affects their decisions. They make reference. I don't, I don't really know how much talk about work in progress, how interested people be, or, I mean, obviously nobody's going to steal the idea because it's not that, that uh, original, steal but it. basically steal it, man, steal it. We'll co-write it. Um, but the uh, basically, they have they have a then in the initial kind of hook or the first turning point they get they're they're these country kids out of town and there's no place to stay and you have to register at an address where there's a bunch of services that will show you a real address even though you don't have one so basically you have thousands of people that are getting ready to enlist they're all homeless and they're running around on the streets and they there's lots of fireworks shows and distractions kind of like to keep the populace busy. But anyway, so they're basically party and never been to town before, literally. And um, they get crosswise with kind of some street toughs. But as it's about to happen, a bunch of soldiers walk by. They're going on liberty. And so you think, oh, okay, everything's going to be calmed down now. Well, their uncle, who's a big guy and and a veteran, um, he gets crosswise with these soldiers. And they get in a fight, gets out of control, um, you know, and he – he gives him cause, but one of them kills him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's, he's not, uh, he wasn't doing the right thing. I mean, he shouldn't have been, he basically breaks one of their backs and, um, and it just goes downhill from there and he gets shot and he dies. Well, they have to join the two brothers. They have to join their twins, but they're not identical twins. They have to j- do some sort of mandatory service and they got to do the civil service or the military, the civil service, you have to be a lot more educated and it pays less and they wind up both choosing to go into the military for different reasons. Um, the main protagonist, he's like, he's upset that what happened, but he doesn't absolve his uncle of blame because he knows his uncle's a hothead and got in this fight, you know, and, and, and you know, what was a person going to do? Uh Oh, I got a visitor. <laughs> All right, buddy, let me finish, okay? All right, we'll be there in a minute. It's a star. Uh, he ninjaed up on me. So um, so anyway. Hey, Brittany. All right. I love it when people check in. That's the coolest thing about Blab. It's awesome. Yeah. But anyway, so basically what happens is the, the kind of some of the – it's not really the plot or the story, but it will affect their character arc – is the two brothers, they both join the military, but they have different, the main character, Duke, he does not um, let his uncle off the hook. He still kind of blames him and gives him basically 
He says, you know, it's partially his fault what happened. Well, his other brother is a little bit more emotional and artistic, and he blames the soldiers. And he's going in the military because he's going to find these guys and do whatever. Um, and he makes a bitch. Yeah, and that's that's more of the character plot. It's not really – the main plot of it is basically there's some alien contact, a couple different types of alien contact, the forces of Earth, per se, or whatever planet I decided to put it on. Um, they got to choose, and I think they're going to choose the wrong alien to side with, and that's going to cause conflict. I have basic – headings for several books outlined. But anyway, that's, uh, I can't remember how I got off on that, but um, we were talking about character uh, points of view and stuff. Um, are you writing? Is that going <laughs> to, I still got more. Yeah, I know. You're always going to have more. Is that something where you're going to write just a, a regular straightforward third person or are you want to play around with dual um, first persons or what? Right now, I'm sticking with uh, the limit or the controlled third person. Um, for example, the first the first um, chapter is in Duke's point of view, and he's the main character. He's the, kind of the older of the two fraternal twins. Um, and then I think if I look through what I wrote last summer, the next chapter I think is in their father's point of view, and it takes place in a different location back on the in the borderlands. And it turns out his his father. His father's the oldest son on a farm, exempted from military service, but serves in the local militia. Well, he somehow has some sort of contact with one of these aliens. I don't know if it comes down on their ranch. And, um, and so there's some conflicts. The, the subheading is alien spy. And I can't remember what that means because I wrote it last summer. But um, so I'll shift points of view, one point of view per chapter. I think that you can switch points of view more than that, but I don't think I'm at the level where I can switch point of view three times in a chapter. Most people don't like that. Um, well, we have a whole bunch of people watching now. Uh, does anybody have a particular uh, favorite point of view or a favorite book that they read that uh, the point of view of the character, the narrative stood out over anyone else? Yes. The Martian that, the Martian from the, like the first paragraph, the point of view of the character, that what, that's what made the book. It probably Great opening been, line on that one. Yeah, it probably would have been super boring and just drawn out if the guy had not cursed every five words. Uh, and the, uh, I don't know if you've listened to the auto, audio book version, but uh, R.C. Bray is the guy who read the book for the audio. And uh, R.C. Bray, he... He sounds like Mark Watney. If I would oh, have, really? if I yeah. would have met Mark Watney in person, this guy would have. Yeah, I agree. The movie wasn't nearly as good. Yeah, and it sucks because yeah. the, they the different movies are always different. Well, it, saw, it could have I been fantastic. Don't, don't judge a book by its movie. You see that meme on Facebook? I have not. Don't, seen ju it. don't judge a book by its movie. Uh, yeah, no, The Martian was super good. Um, Hold on a second. Yeah, sure. I'm trying to figure it out. There's another book that I've read recently that I really like, the POV. I'm actually interested to see what his newest, uh, the book he's got working on now, Andy Weir. He says it's like a uh, a straightforward sci-fi book with aliens and stuff, and I'm, I'm worried about it. Well, that door shut, buddy. Yeah, I, I admire his amount of research. Um that's something that I'm like, he really, and I don't know, I'm not enough of a scientist to know how I could, everything he is, but it's very convincing what he did. Well, I'll tell you that, that the coolest thing that I think that he did, uh, that he said in several interviews is that he has, he had a calendar and date and time set up so that when they were contacting uh, Earth and, and Mars were talking to each other, that the lag time was correct for where the planets would have been in the solar system. And when he originally wrote his program to tell him where the programs or where the planets would be and how long it would take for the messages to get there, he messed up and he had like a, a decimal point in the wrong place or some shit. Oh. And so when he found out that he messed up, he went back, rewrote it, and then had to rewrite all, all the... Um... Yes, I actually... Um, Mark Watney and... Um, uh, was it the director, the the station? 
I can't remember who the other guy I'm was. Terrible with, I'm terrible with the names, but yeah, it added a lot of dramatic tension. That was a good, you know, if that, and I, I haven't read the book yet, unfortunately. Um, I have it in the, the ebook and the audio book, but, you know, switching and, uh, back between the two viewpoints is what we're talking about. And it's, it's right. He, when he wrote it, writing online, uh, he wrote it on a blog, which this is what blows me away with uh, writing is that this guy wrote it on a blog and he wasn't trying to make money. He wasn't trying to be a millionaire and people convinced him to put it on Amazon, even though he really didn't want to make any money from it. He had to make it 99 cents because of the time that's the cheapest you could go. Yeah. And didn't have draft to digital. And now, now, and now he's got an Oscar nominated movie. He didn't win any Oscars, which was disappointing. Um, but considering the movies, he went up against it. Yeah. Well, that's every writer's dream is just to write what you enjoy and then be able to just do it, get enough financial success that you can just keep writing what you enjoy. Exactly. You know? Um, so yeah, that's pretty awesome. I, uh, Talking about favorite viewpoint books, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of any that are distinctive just for their viewpoint. I know Stephen King seems he does his basically chapter by chapter points of view, but he will slip into omniscient or limited omniscient a lot. I know Black House, um, there's a huge omniscient um, opening where it's like the point of view is sweeping in almost like a drone or something mm -hmm. or some sort of real drones. And I guess. Also, when I was thinking about the topic for today's show with the viewpoints and the head jumping, I was driving back from my part time and I thought, well, what if they're just writing an omniscient or a limited omniscient point of view? And, you know, I've read about some of that stuff. I've actually wanted to write an omniscient. And I mean, that used to be the style a long time I can't ago. can't think of any books. That it I've seems hard. Hey. Almost I'm all of your old literary books are in omniscient. Um, if I remember, and I, of course, now I can't think of one, but I can't think of any. Well, yeah, I just haven't read any literary stuff like that for so long, but I'm pretty sure they, they pretty much are. I'm pretty sure Dickens mostly wrote in Omniscient. Three body problem. You know, I've heard about that. The three body problem. I have not heard of that. I'm going to write, make a note. What's the genre for that book? It's science fiction. Oh. I read up any of the language. But... Oh, sweet. Um, well, and so I was thinking about this omniscient thing, and basically I think that if you're going to write an omniscient or limited omniscient, you have to establish that early, like maybe in your opening scene. Is this uh, so, is the three-body pro uh, problem? Is that omniscient? Yes and no. Yes and no. I'll have to take a look at that. Didn't that this... might be a good one just for kind of like uh, in one of the self-publishing podcasts, they're talking about reading, expanding your reading. And that might be a good one to read for like development of craft. Not a, not a book on craft, but to kind of see something done a different way. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever read anything from... China, that might be interesting. It's, it's funny because... When that would be cool. Uh, like science fiction is so... We were talking about space opera right at the beginning of the uh, show. And uh, it's funny the differences between like British English uh, space opera and like American space opera. Because, yeah. you know, like British is very uh, society-based. Like uh, where it like... American space opera is very military. Like if you talk about space opera, a military right. with mil they have big space navies and battles. And right. You you have the same thing with British space opera, but it's it's not focused so much on. I like the, the, the British the way they do military, and if you're, like in all the Patrick O'Brien books, I like the way they uh, they talk. You know, if you ever listen to audiobooks, they're worth listening to just for the way. The real formalized uh, mm -hmm. military the way they dress each other. I like it a lot. I think reading something by a Chinese author or author from any place other than like where I'm from, you wonder what's it might what the psychology psychology is under the words or behind the story, because you know 
things are di a lot different. Um, I like watching that. Uh, Places Unknown, I think, is one of the, is a show where this, the, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's a cook that goes around and sees all these different parts of the world. That's always fascinating. Well, it's, it's interesting to me uh, to, to all, to read things from different parts of the world that have uh, completely different points of view of the world or, or like, you know, we always look at um, China as the East um, but how do they look at themselves? You know what I mean? Like they don't look at themselves. Right. So east of the east of where? Right. That's what I don't understand. Like they say the Middle East and then the East and like we're in the West. But where does that? I mean, obviously it starts in uh, in England and goes from either place. But now that we know that England is not the center of the world, shouldn't that change? Like our our uh, yeah We've nomenclature started. of the world. Let's all go to the North Pole and we'll call everything the South. <laughs> I think the cultural cultural uh, overtones and stuff would, would be interesting as well on that. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to take that a look. It, it, apparently, it's part of a trilogy I'm, I'm reading on Wikipedia. Is the, uh, do you know if the other books are out yet, or is it just the first one so far? Oh, okay. Awesome. Cool. So uh, how, how deep is your reading list right now, Josh? My reading list? Uh, what do you, what's on your plate to read? Oh, sh my Goodreads panel is ridiculous. Um, I can't even keep up my Goodreads panel. I, 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 I like Goodreads, but I don't go there nearly enough. I, uh, yeah. right, I just finished the entire first trilogy of Mistborn. The, you said that was awesome. Uh, that, you know what it, it's probably the when you're talking about like closure and complete story of a trilogy the way that it's supposed to be um, the the Mistborn trilogy is phenomenal like I, I a lot of trilogies like you go back and you reread and you're like oh that was cool that he did that or that was cool that he did that but I didn't I just the first time through I was like that's amazing that he was able to do all of that talking about POVs in um, the final empire. Well, no, in the hero of ages, which is the last book in the trilogy, you get to experience a point of view of a race of characters that you meet in the first and uh, first book and the second book. But you, I mean, you just see them through basically a human's point of view. Mm -hmm. And in the third book, you actually experience the world through this, they're, um, they're called, uh, oh, what are they called? Oh, I can't think of the name. It's a, it's not a miswraith, but it's something else. Anyway, um, basically they can take the bones of a dead thing and generate themselves into that. They can basically create themselves to look exactly like that person. But huh. in their in their normal form, it's just like a big goop of muscle. Like that's it. They don't have <laughs> they don't have bones. And, with bones. Yeah. And yeah. so and so uh, one of the like the characters thrown into this prison and in this prison is just this big like no, it's not a big, it's a box. And they he this this kid's shapeshifter is in this box and they're feeding him this slop goop for food and he can't get out and but then when he talks about uh, digesting all the bones and making his form and all that, you're like, oh, that's a really cool point of view. And again, with, yeah. uh, with uh, the, uh, in the first book, the main antagonist characters uh, are called Inquisitors. And these characters have spikes that are driven through their body. I like the Wheel of Time, they have Inquisitors, don't they? Oh, I don't know. I've never read that book. Oh, uh, well, okay. most books. But, um, but yeah, these... Uh, the Inquisitors, the they have spikes that are driven through their eyes, and they have spikes that are all over their body. And in the, in the first book, book, you you know that they have spikes, but you have no idea why. And in the second book, you kind of learn why, but then you really learn why in the third book because it's part of the magic system. <clears throat> right. Um, but I can't remember if it's the second book or the third book. You there's there are narratives that are written from the point of view of an Inquisitor. And the way that he descri describes the world through the eyes of his inquisitor is they can only see metal traces. 
So hmm. everything in the world has metal in it. Like we have like trace metals in us right. and, and everything else. On a molecular level. Right. And so that showed that's what they see. And that's how he describes what they see. And it was, and it's not a huge thing. It doesn't make or break the book. But when you read it, you're like, that's amazing that he sat there and thought about what it would look like if these characters saw through uh, metal. But so I just finished that series and I'm reading, actually, it's a novella um, that is a companion to that that says there's some spoilers for the books that are coming up. Oh. Um, so uh, hopefully I don't. A good book I'll read more than once. So, I mean, obviously the first time it's nice not to have any spoilers, but like I, I've, I've listened to the entire Game of Thrones series twice and most of it a, a third time. And so, and I still keep finding out new stuff, but yeah, it's, it's bad. The first time through a book's always the best time. I'm i uh, I'm also reading uh, defiance by Lucas Bale and that's, it's going a little slow for me in that. And I've got defiance defiance. And I started reading uh, the rewinder by Brett battles. Uh, but had I known it was YA, I probably wouldn't have started writing it, uh, reading it. Uh, but I'm halfway through now, and it's kind of interesting. It's about um, time travelers that basically go back. The premise is they go back and witness history, um, because in the in the present day of the book, they have a cast of people that are numbered one through eight and ones are basically like your normal elite privileged people. And then eight is, you know, like poor underprivileged underclass people. Well, anyway, to prove, to prove uh, your status as a one, two or three or whatever, they pay these rewinders to go back and trace their lineage through history. So they go back and, uh, for months and weeks at a time, they go back and they trace these events to make sure that these ones and twos and threes are actually like noble people. But the thing is, it's, nobody's perfect. Well, that is true. And uh, the, the the twist in the book is that the in the past the Revolutionary War didn't happen. Oh. So so it's all the British all Empire. History. Yeah. That's what it turns out to be, but I didn't realize that when I started watching, uh, reading it. It's it's based as uh, it's written as though the British Empire continued See, to that's, happen, and that and that's cool because you know that that would obviously there wasn't too much info dump in the beginning because if you were a character in that story, you wouldn't say, "Look, we are now in the British Empire." That is taking right. the whole because you know, because that ha- it's it's that like we don't we don't start our talking to somebody like oh I grew up in America because America is America and we live here in well, America. It's like that sci-fi book without naming it where the the uh, we we were talking about a while back where the captain calls in his second in command and has her recount the history. <laughs> Tell me about the history of the empire. Yeah. Like either of them wouldn't know that. And right. what, what, what an awkward, unnatural conversation that would be. To, to start out what I, I think he was like giving her command of a ship or something. And yeah. yeah. Uh, I've watched the show. Tell me why we're here. The, the maid, the maid and Butler. I think Sanderson talks about that in one of his, what is that? What's the uh, podcast? He has the, uh, Writing about dragons, right about it's dragons. Called? It's well, right it's his dragons. YouTube channel, but yeah, and he talks about the maiden butler, where the maiden butler come on and say, "As you know, the master is out of the house, and the lady's in the garden." And yeah. I sure hope something doesn't happen now. Yeah. Well, if you had known that, why'd you talk about it? Yeah. Um, yes, I have watched the Expanse. I haven't finished it yet. Uh, I think I'm on like episode seven. Uh, you know, I listen to um, audio books. They they were ver- the the point of views for the characters were simple uh, because they had to be, but in the show they combined like books one and two, and so like in the book you only get Holden and Miller, but in the show you get Holden Miller and Avasar Avasarla Avasarla. <laughs> Can't even say her name right. Uh, but you <laughs> That's also why I'm get not a narrator. Yeah, but you also get. Um, oh, what's the uh, the OPA's uh, leader? Uh, oh, oh at, gosh, uh, dang it. 
the guy who stormed the, uh, the bases. The, yeah, the butcher of Anderson Station, but now right. I can't remember his name. Um, you know, I liked it. I liked the series because um, it wasn't a lot of sci-fi shows on the sci-fi channel are ridiculously corny for no other reason that they think that sci-fi has to be corny. And I liked the show because it wasn't that it was very serious most of the time. And, uh, yeah, like, um, for instance, well, Firefly wasn't a sci-fi series, but it was goofy, but it wasn't like corny or like a specific, like an overplayed trope that they always do. Like, uh, like dark. Everybody Matter. likes Firefly. Everybody loves Firefly. It's my favorite yeah. show. It's but like awesome. the, uh, dark, dark matter that came out, uh, you know, I like started Farscape. watching. I started watching Farscape, and maybe I just need to watch it because somebody recommended it to me, and I watched the first well, part of the first episode. But I think I was either half drunk or half asleep when I watched it. I didn't pay attention to it at all. I, I watched so it I back when I had to get copies of it on VHS because I was always. It's way better. Yeah, <laughs> everything's better probably <laughs> on TV. If you got some mind altering something. Yeah, but, yeah, I like I liked Farscape. You know, like I haven't watched The Expanse. I really wanted to, um, but I just my work schedule is so bad. I never can follow a series. If if I watch it, I'm gonna have to wait till it's over, buy it on DVD, and then binge, binge watch it. Like I gotta wait till it's on. And all that. Gotta wait till it's on Netflix. That's how I watched Fringe. I watched, I watched Fringe. What is that? Five five seasons or six seasons or something? And I watched it from the beginning of Fringe all the way through. And sometimes yeah. though that. Uh, sometimes though that gets a little, what do you say? Like, you're like, Oh my God, this is so much. Like you're watching yeah. it. And you're like the first sometimes season. You is... can't stop. And sometimes you're like, they're just filling space. Yeah. It's like, they could have done this in eight episodes, but they made 14 now cause it's popular and it's. Well, that's like, uh, have you ever seen house of cards? On I have Netflix? not seen it yet. Uh, it's not sci-fi. It's uh, political. Um, it's political and it's, it's drama, present day drama, um, but yeah, it's only ten episodes, so it's it's not a whole lot to binge on. Uh, and I've been watching it from the beginning, but we, this season I felt like there was a lot of. If I had watched it like week to week to week, maybe it would have been a little different. But just watching it all the way through, I'm like nothing. Nothing really happened. Nothing happened. I yeah. mean, it's a great show. And there's a lot. The characters are fantastic, but. The um, talking about watching the series like that earlier, you're talking about uh, young adult fiction, which I, I'll read it sometimes. But my wife and I started watching um, 100 on Netflix, yeah. And it's it's basically going to repopulate the earth mm -hmm. after a nuclear, and it sounds very interesting, but it's very much a, a, a YA series. And we watch about 20 minutes of it, and Jen's like, I'm out. What well, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the, the teen, teen romance. Uh, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. It's 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 YA because it's teenagers that are sent back to right. repopulate. Because if you're 18, they put you to death. But if you're 17, they can throw you down onto the planet and let you fend for yourself. Um, and I'll, I'll probably watch it. You know, I I, I don't mind uh, YA fiction. It's kind of interesting sometimes. But yeah, I could tell that I was getting a bad vibe as soon as we started watching it. I'm like, eh, <laughs> no. I need to watch it. I've seen corny. it on Netflix, but I haven't watched it. The premise looks pretty cool. It looks like it could be really cool, but it, you know, it's definitely a little bit of the they're they're a little corny. I uh, oh, talking yeah. about guilty pleasure. I'll watch talking it. about YA and corniness. The thing that the, the thing that bugs me about YA is they make they build it up, especially like in in the trilogies so far. And I haven't finished. Um, um, the uh, Hunger Games trilogy yet. The movie just came out, so I'm going to watch that. I couldn't finish the books, but like yeah. uh, Divergent and Allegiant and Insurgent. When, uh, I listened Twilight. to Divergent because I had to paint something and it took me like 20 hours. So that. You know, I, I the thing that made me mad is I. I, I uh, Twilight even, for Space. <laughs> yeah. I listened uh, to the I, entire Twilight series in audiobooks, and those are long books. And I was like, oh, I want to see how they're doing this. Why is this such a bestseller? I'm going to read it. And I was like, you know, I was kind of interested. Like I said, maybe a guilty pleasure going back to high school or whatever with vampires. But by the by, the end of like the fifth book. It was a bestseller. Yeah, it was 
poorly written, but the Twilight series, by the time I, because that's a, you know, you can read a book a lot faster than you can listen to it. By the time I listened to the entire Twilight series, I was just, wow, that was a lot of time I can't get back. Well, it's like, but it was very simple the way they ended it. Um, I mean, it was cool, but like, like a Divergent, I, 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 the, the idea for Divergent was decent. But I got... Um, it was underdeveloped. It could have done a lot more with that. Well, I started... I, I wanted to read it. And then I've been spoiled. Uh, not spoiled, but disappointed by getting to the end of a third book in a trilogy. And yeah. it's like the... Um, it's like the... Uh, oh, he was just dreaming the whole time. And you're yeah. like, you're stupid. Well, the Dallas ending. Yeah. And so See, I, uh, I, re I read... I went forward and I cheated. Um, I went forward to the Wikipedia page for the last book in that trilogy for Divergent mm -hmm. just to see. And because I read the, uh, on the reviews on Amazon, like the first two books are really good. And then the last book in the, in the, uh, in the trilogy, ev everybody was like, this sucks. This is the worst book. This is the worst ending of the series. So I read the Wikipedia and, uh, <laughs> reviews I mean, can be harsh. Sometimes I ignore reviews, but sometimes there's something to be said. Yeah. And the thing is about that book is she finished it and she gave a completely ridiculous reason for why everything happened in the book. And yeah. it was, it didn't have any, like, okay, it's sci-fi. You've got to take things with a, a leap of faith or like the self-publishing pod guy, podcast guys say in their unicorn Western. That's not what happened. I'm like, yeah, but there's a unicorn in it. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So that, the rules are a little, little bit, a little bit yeah. looser because we got unicorns that that you know, bleed rainbows and whatnot. Right, but, and yeah. it works to a point. But when you when you base your entire series on a, a single idea, that when you read that and, idea, and the whole point you're reading it is is like I want to find out what's going on. Yeah, and that's my main reason to stay with that series. Was like, what is happening? And yeah. then when they finally tell what's happening, it's a big letdown. Yeah. The other problem I have while I'm thinking about it with the uh, YA genre is, is that I don't know if they always respect the readers that well. It's like they want to keep you, you have these mm -hmm. characters who are like, you know, in their teens, maybe. And um, they write to what they perceive that level is for that age group. And then they don't let the plots or the characters develop anywhere outside of that narrowly defined role. Right. And it's the same way with the main plot, like a divergent. They had like, and the same thing with Hunger Games. There's like one basic drive of why the Hunger Games happen. And if you write three books, the story should develop a little bit more. But instead, they keep just hammering that same point over and over again, all the way to the end. And by the third book, I'm just tired of it. I, I right. was expecting more development. Well, but that's the thing is they develop. Yes, yeah, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter is awesome. With. When you talk about YA, Harry Potter blows me away. Not only is it a fantastic story from book one to book seven, but every book in between is, first of all, it's its own story in and of itself. And, and there's a very tight point of view. Yes, and it contributes to the overall narrative. Um, but I, I can't – the only thing that bugs me about Harry Potter when I read it now is – they say um, they say you don't want to write with adverbs, and Harry Potter is completely filled with adverbs. So you like you read it, and he was like, "She laughed fantastically, or whatever." And I'm like, <laughs> "I can't, I can't." Laughing, laughingly. It's it's hard to get past that, but but yeah. once you once you get past it, and you you need you, adverbs sometimes, but boy, it can become they become a crutch. It's like. People that say, um, uh, mm, uh, when they're talking, mm -hmm. they don't realize they're doing it. I think some yeah. writers use adverbs the same way. Yeah, but you can almost uh, always cut them. The thing that blows me away was it was her first book. I mean, I'm sure there were some editor editor changes, and but when you when you talk about someone's first book and then they they write seven of them, and hell, you can look at David Weber's stuff, and you get to seven books in a David Weber series, and you're like this. Is ridiculous. Stop writing and wrap it up. But she did it, and it Got was her better. first. Yeah, and well, they they used to say that about. Um, I had a garage band in high school, and we'd always talk about a band's first album is usually awesome because they've been writing it for ten years, 
But then the second album, yeah, they got six months to knock something out in the studio. Yeah. So writing yeah. could be the same way. But a lot of first books, I mean, I, I have I have a big thumb drive full of first books that nobody will ever see, obviously, probably for, for the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my one, I've got one that I wrote in a, a uh, one-subject notebook when I was 14, yeah. the yeah. alien spaceships and that's never going to go anywhere ever. Yeah. It's all practice. It's good though. Well, we've, we've been going on for a while. We probably need to yeah. wrap this up. It's awesome. We got so many people checking in and making comments. It's very, very cool. Being a writer, you know, you you write, you can tell I'm writing in my basement next to the water heater and the sunk pump. So it's good to, to, to have some interaction and see everybody checking in, whether they're writers or not. Yeah. Hey, Reader, thanks. Reader for, uh, is always welcome as well. Thanks for. I um, think it, did you pronounce it Bick Nels Nelski or is that just your last name Nelski? Critic and a consumer. Well, hey, thanks for joining in. Our <clears throat> awesome. I love writers and okay. critics and consumers. All very good. It uh, seems thanks like. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Um, my name's Scott Moon. I have a web page, ScottMoonWriter dot com. If you want to go look at it, that'd be great. Obviously, no pressure, Josh. Uh, yeah, Josh Hayes, joshhayeswriter.com. Uh, we're both indie writers just starting out and figured talking about stuff like this will yeah. help us learn and grow. And Good maybe times. Some people that watch will do the same. Well, thanks for joining, and we'll see you guys uh, next week probably. All right, I'm going to lock out. It might be a little bit rough since, like I said, this is a new uh, – lab's kind of new for both of us. Um, there was somebody that called in earlier. We're not really taking – extra people on here right now but so i'm gonna go ahead and try to turn it off i think what I, I think what happens i kick you josh and then um and then i turn it down and then i can figure out if the recording works so okay cool see you next time man later bud see everybody bye